Oh my gosh, good morrow, friends. Here we are. It is, oh my gosh, it's already 11 central. We are into the last day. We're in the closing third of this marathon known as the Ruby Conf. Okay, here we are. Well, it is my pleasure to welcome you into day three. Um, as you are all very well aware, the community on Slack has been super, super vibrant, and I hope you've had the opportunity to really participate in as much of that as possible. I have heard rumors, mostly seen pictures, that folks did do the karaoke last night upon Nine Zoom, which must have been so smooth, I would imagine, or not. Who knows? But regardless, I am seeing so much fun, fun, fun stuff that's going on. So a uh, massive applause to all of you for keeping this community alive and vibrant. I really appreciate it personally, and I know that all of us that are first timers here appreciate it too. So thank you all. All right, so let's kick this day off. I want to bring to the stage Marty, one of the organizers here at Ruby Central, one of the directors, um, to introduce our keynote for the day. Howdy, Marty. Hello. Good morning. How are we all doing, RubyConf? Doing all right? Normally, I'd be able to hear you all shout back from the audience, but we're virtual, so that's not going to happen. Um, I do, though, sorely uh, miss seeing you all in person. I am a director, by the way, at Ruby Central, and um, you've often seen me on stage before. Uh, but so far with this conference, I've been behind the scenes doing uh, stuff in Crowdcast. But this morning, I get to introduce our next keynote speaker. Now, um, for some of you, um, he needs no introduction. You're familiar with his work. Um, but I suspect there are a good number in our audience who are not familiar with Kent Beck. Um, though, I suspect you have encountered some of the ideas he's championed over the years. Um, personally, um, Kent's works... Uh, have had a major impact on how I approach and uh, write software. Uh, I remember uh, very distinctly back in 2004 when I uh, uh, joined a small software team that was uh, going to practice XP or extreme programming. That I uh, then had to uh, was introduced these books and it changed everything. Um, so the uh, some of these ideas you're probably familiar with like test-driven development, unit testing, refactoring, thinking in patterns, uh, pair programming, and other agile practices, uh, which is wild to think that back then, uh, we it was fairly rare that this was done on Teams. And I remember having to advocate that we would do some of these practices on some of my software teams. But now, uh, it's fairly commonplace. Uh, so Kent is no stranger to our conferences. He's spoken here before. The last time was in 2015 in Atlanta for RailsConf, um, but he's come back to share his insights with us today. So without further ado, please welcome Kent Beck to our virtual stage. <laughs> lessons of uh, COVID and isolation and lots and lots and lots of video is that every meeting is better if it starts with banjo. So there you go. That's, uh, that's my talk. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, so here's, I, I, I told this story uh, uh, just now in the green room and I'll, I'll tell it again. I've always had a lot of um, imposter syndrome around music. I've been playing for 50 years and I always like, oh, if I only I was better. So I figured if I just forced myself to practice, I would get better and then I'd be good enough. And so I would force myself to practice for a while and I'd get better, but I was never good enough. And um, then I'd get discouraged and uh, the cycle continues. And when isolation started, I just made a habit of starting every Zoom meeting two minutes early 
Uh, can I say Zoom on, on Crowdcast? Am I going to be? Anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. If I get cut off immediately, you'll know. So uh, I would start every Zoom meeting with a couple minutes of music, banjo, guitar. Um, and uh, But I'd show up early. And then I noticed that people's, other people started showing up early just to catch the music. And they loved it. And they gave me so much positive feedback that I wanted to practice because I wanted to be better because I wanted more of that stuff. So... Your second lesson is uh, it's not about the ironclad willpower. It's about human connection. I hate when that happens, but there you go. Um, okay, so I do have other messages uh, than that. Uh, that would probably be, be plenty, but uh, I, I do have a, a message. And what it is is a general principle reversibility as applied to software development. And I'll make a, another meta comment. If you haven't seen me talk, and by the way, this is my first Rails conf, a Ruby conf talk ever. So I'm that first timer that, uh, that Adam mentioned. Unwind, uh, meta comment, ah, is that uh, if you want, to come up with ideas, come up with combinations of ideas. It's really hard to think up a new idea idea from scratch. But relative to that, it's easy to take two ideas that nobody, just nobody ever put together before, put them together and something interesting comes out of that. So lots of the stuff I write, you'll see that as a, as a theme. And here it is, reversibility is general principle as applied to team software development. So we're gonna take those two things together and see what comes out the, the other side. Now I have had some questions about my presentation software. So this is a Canson XL, 160 gram. For any of you pen heads out there, oh, I have a lot of pens and a lot of paper. This is beautiful paper, High, highly recommend. And then, uh, and then these uh, uh, Windsor and Newton uh, brush markers, again, Highly recommended. So that's the uh, that's the software that I'll be using today. Presentation. Maybe we'll have a giveaway if any of these slides turn out cool. That would be fun. Okay, so first idea is reversibility, and what are we talking about here? Um, <clears throat> I recently debuted a uh, a workshop with uh, Jesse Tron, Jessica Kerr called Invitation to Systems Thinking. And as the wheel turns, as it always does, we, we went from uh, a, a very reductionist approach to software development to a very holistic one. And now we're back to kind of reductionist, like, oh, what are the numbers? And we're gonna make the numbers go up and then everything will be better. And whenever the wheel turns that direction, the antidote is, Systems thinking. So this is the idea that uh, 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 Jessica's uh, uh, motto is uh, relationality over rationality. This is the idea that in any complicated system, uh, you don't have control, but you're not helpless. It's There's a bunch of pieces in your system, and it's their relationships that really um, make it challenging. I mean, it's both. The power of the system is that you get more than the sum of the parts. And that's also what prevents you from having control over what the system does. Um, so uh, you can go look at systemsthinking.dev for uh, information if you're interested in this workshop. It's a lot of fun. We just did the first one a couple of weeks ago. We're going to do another one in January. End of commercial plug. Um, in 2001, two, maybe at an early, early extreme programming conference, we had a presentation by, uh, Professor Zaninoto, who was the Dean of the School of Economics at the University of Trento. And he said, this extreme programming stuff. Now, remember, this is the point 
at which extreme programming was wild and crazy and this could never possibly work. And he said, from an economist perspective, extreme programming makes perfect sense. And here's how it makes sense. And he gave this fantastic presentation, some of the clearest thinking that I've ever heard. And it still took me about 15 years to figure out what he was talking about. So here, in a nutshell, is it you guys will pick up on this quicker than I did. Thank goodness for that. Um, what makes, if you have some big complicated system, there's no clear relationship between inputs and outputs. You change the inputs and then what happens next, uh, who knows? So if you have a, a giant factory and one little thing, seemingly little thing can go wrong and the whole factory shuts down. Or you can take away an element in the factory and all of a sudden everything works more smoothly. So what is this? This is the over rationality part. You can't figure out by looking at all the pieces in the system what's going on. And uh, what the professor said was, there's a reason for that. And it's because large complicated systems have, first they just have many, many states. So I'm gonna be sad that I wrote that large, but there you go. They have lots and lots of states. So you might think, oh, the system is in this state. So if I do this thing, the same thing's gonna happen the last time it was in that state. Well. Duh. there are too, too many states to be able to say the system is in this state. I remember the, the first time I ever pushed code at, at Facebook, the message that came back was uh, your code was successfully pushed to 6,300 out of 6,400 servers. And I panicked. I'm like, oh, no, what's on those other servers? People said, ah, who knows? It's not causing problems. Don't worry about it. Well, each one of those servers was in some kind of state and it wasn't even possible to understand what the states were, much less understand what would happen if I changed the inputs. How are the outputs going to change? So uh, another uh, problem here is interconnection. And this is the idea that the, the pieces in the system don't stand alone. Any piece could alter any other piece. So, for example, at Augusto, my, my employer, where we do small business payroll and benefits, um, uh, if you look at Gusto itself as a system and how we deliver service to people, you can say, well, this many customers call in with this kind of problem and this many customers call in with this kind of problem and it, it takes a person this many hours to resolve it. So uh, retroactive address changes costs us uh, uh, $14 per customer per year, something like that. We can take all the costs of serving our customers and we can, we can break it down and we can say, well, here's the benefits ones and here's the payroll ones and of the payroll ones, then this and then that up, 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 up. And down here we got, we have 14 cents per customer per year, or whatever it is. And, and that accounts for all the costs, all the historical costs. But those aren't leaves in a tree. All of those seeming leaves are potentially connected to all of the other ones. So I can reduce over here, I can reduce this 10 cents to zero by making some change and accidentally cause this other one to increase from 40 cents to $2. And if I'm not looking very carefully at what I'm doing, those interconnections are gonna make it impossible for me to go and control this, this system. I, I, eliminate 14 cents here and 14 cents gets eliminated from the top. Nah, sometimes I eliminate 14 cents here and $2 goes away from the top and sometimes $2 gets increased in the top. 
So that's this sense of interconnection. We're not dealing with leaves in a tree. We're dealing with uh, items that are all potentially connected to each other. And in software development, we talk about coupling as a measure of that, that interconnection between the elements in a software design. Uh, a third source of difficulty is the variation. So the reason we can't control this system is because things change. Um, the external world will change. Even the internal world will change. Something like a wear in a mechanical system will cause small differences. And sometimes small differences make no difference in the end. Sometimes small differences will make very large differences in the end. And we can't account for all of this variation. And the, the last uh, element that makes systems impossible to control is, reverse, is irreversibility. Which is, once we make a decision, we can't unmake it. And uh, irreversibility is all around us. I recently decided to downsize my stuff. Um, uh, and so I thought, well, I've got all these boxes of books uh, that I've collected for decades and dec decades. It's like 50 boxes of books. And uh, they're stored away, but I'd like to just get rid of them. But... I feel kind of funny about getting rid of them because I have a lot of attachment to these books. If I just discarded the books, that would be an irreversible decision. I couldn't get them back. I couldn't even remember what they all were because it's thousands, literally thousands of books. So I thought, ah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan all of my books into Goodreads and then if I want to read them again, if I want to remember what I've read, and if I want to read them again, Kindle is there. I can go get a copy, get an electronic copy, and I can reread anything that I've ever read in the last years. So that's, a, that's an example of an irreversible decision turning into a reversible decision. Uh, an, another part of my downsizing is my journals. So one of my practices every morning is, I'll just free associate for two pages worth. I'll just write, write whatever comes into my head. And sometimes it's trivial stuff and sometimes it's my plans for the day and sometimes it's deep thoughts and so on. But I have a shelf full of these journals. And I thought, well, maybe I should get rid of those too because it feels good. Like 50 boxes is just gone. That's like three fourths of my physical stuff is gone and that felt good. Maybe I should get rid of my journals too. But getting rid of the journals is an irreversible decision. I was able to make the, the getting rid of the books a reversible decision because of the magic of Kindle and so on. But getting rid of the journals is irreversible. Now, I could make it into a reversible decision by carefully scanning each page, blah, blah, blah. But that is definitely more trouble than I wanna go to. So. There we have these decisions uh, 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 which can be reversible or irreversible. If you're in a complicated system and you make an irreversible decision, you can't take it back. If you, if you, uh, if you accidentally send your, the, the details of your customer list out onto the internet, you can't, you can't take it back. And distinguishing between reversible and irreversible decisions is really important. So back to Professor Zanonoto, he says, it's these four factors that make operating complicated systems so difficult. And extreme programming makes perfect sense as a way of addressing this kind of complication in software development because it takes many, many decisions that previously were irreversible and makes them reversible. So if you plan every day, it, plan every day, then something changes. You realize yesterday's plan was bad. You only lost a day. You reorganize the priorities and away you go. So compare that to the 
old timey waterfally, which no one would ever, ever do. <sighs> Except this is another one where the wheel is turned and somehow people are talking about waterfall like it works and it doesn't work for all the reasons it never worked. And there are alternatives. <sighs> okay. Thought I'd slain that dragon. Nah. But uh, in a, a big waterfall, so we've got, this is the scope and we're going to deliver in six months. And that's that. That's an irreversible decision. If you decide, if you realize, oh, that's the wrong thing to do, it's really hard to change that because you've made commitments about what's going to be delivered when. But in an, the XP planning style and iterative planning style, uh, okay, last week, bah, we thought we needed this and we don't really need it. And now it's now we don't have it anymore and away we go. You replan and, and, and off you go. Or if the design is wrong, the architecture is wrong, you discover that later because you always discover things because the alternative to discovering things is being dead and nobody likes that. Um, then you change it. There aren't irreversible decisions in extreme programming of, of that sort. Now, as I try to apply, as a geek, I try to apply these principles to my life. And it turns out there's plenty of irreversible decisions in your life. You can't just take back a statement that you made to someone you're in a relationship with. It's, there's no revert for, for a, a dumb things that you say. And I've said plenty of dumb things. So it's not always possible, but there are certainly cases where you have irreversible decisions, which can be turned into reversible decisions. And that's part of the power of this style of thinking about complicated systems. I, I was noticing just today, I used, uh, I used the phrase, oh, that ship has sailed. That's a, 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 a that that means that is, the decision was irreversible and it's already made. So even baked into our language is we have the, these metaphors for describing reversibility. So that's that's part number one. That's you've got complicated systems. You can't control them because they have too many states. They have too many interconnections between the elements. There's too much variation that you can't possibly see and the decisions that you make are irreversible. So uh, Henry Ford, for example, in the big Model T plant, he chose to reduce the number of states as a way of controlling the system. So the reason that all the, you can have a car any color you want as long as it's black is not because Henry Ford thought that black was the greatest color. Henry Ford realized that Yes, I have paint. No, I don't have paint. Is much simpler to manage than do I have the right amounts of these various colors? So he deliberately simplified the product to reduce the number of states so that he can operate that big, complicated factory um, in a way that nobody really had before. Okay, so that's reversibility. Now, I'm going to talk about some of my more recent uh, research, which is on software design. Been designing software for a long time. Uh, feel confident about but the boundaries of what I can design and can't design. But I started to dig into it and I realized, oh, I don't really understand this very well at all. And um, I started working on a book called Tidy First, which this is this diagram is is taken from. Uh, I'm still working on the book. Hopefully, we'll get it done. To, uh, we'll see what happens. Anyway, so here's the basic loop in software development. We'll go with a different color, just because. Uh, you have an idea. So we'd like the software to do X, Y, and Z. Okay. And from that idea, you need to change the behavior of the system. So 
well, we need a button that does X, Y, and Z. Okay, so we add the button. Now the behavior is different. And now we can evaluate, okay, was that really a good idea? Do people use it? Do people like it? Are there any problems with it? And from a certain perspective, this is what software development is. If you're not a programmer, this is what software development looks like to you. There's a team. You say, I want a button that does X. Some later time, a button that does X appears. As programmers, we know that this isn't the whole picture. That changing the behavior of the system can be easier or harder depending on its design. So the whole reason we design software is so we, so we can change it. If we never needed to change it, then all variables could be global. All uh, we wouldn't need subroutines. We just have a routine, and it, you know, in come the inputs, and blah 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 blah, blah and out, out come the outputs. The reason that we break our software systems into parts is so that we can change them, and that that change that we, those changes that we make rely on the structure of the system. And this is the part that's kind of underwater if you're not a developer. You say, well, I could add this button, but I'd have to go change here and here and here and here. And if we rearrange the design, then I'd only have to change one place. That's a change to the structure of the system that leads to a change in the behavior. So there's a flow that you need. Sometimes you can go straight from an idea to a change in the behavior and away you go and it's not hard. Sometimes though, you go, you take an idea and you're thinking, ah, this is harder than it needs to be. So I'm gonna, this is the tidy first flow from the title of the book. I'm gonna tidy first. I'm gonna change the structure in a way that makes it easy for me to change the behavior later. So I change the structure. Now changing the behavior is easy. And, and away I go. That's not the whole story. Now, from the, the, the blah, blah. this brings up, it's a whole book's worth of stuff. And I'm giving you, I, half of the talk is about it. So how can I possibly get everything in? I can't. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Another, that would be worth the whole talk right there, I promise. Okay, okay, I, I got this. So sometimes you change the behavior and you, and you had to do it in a messy way because sometimes you, Sometimes there's not a clean way. You can't think of a clean way. So you just go from your idea to the uh, 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 change the behavior. And then you say, oh, you're sitting sitting there. Or this often happens to me in the middle of the night. I wake up and I go, oh, if only the system was structured like this, then those behavior changes we wanted to make would be easy. So there's another flow that goes from I change the behavior do I change, then I change the structure. This is not, this is tidy after. This is, okay, I, I, I had to mess stuff up to get this finished. And now I, now I invest in the structure so that future changes like that will be cheaper, easier, safer, simpler, easier to teach other people to do, and so on. All the good things about a structure that's adapted to the kind of behavior changes that we want to make. Part of the magic of software as a business is that sometimes the structure itself will suggest ideas. And this is where this rigid separation between product and engineering uh, is a uh, suboptimal because the programmers know what's cheap and easy. It's difficult to have that kind of intuition from outside if, without having an appreciation for the structure of the system. So uh, an example, at Gusto, uh, we had a tax calculator. We actually had two tax calculators. We had one that worked, let me see, 
I'll make something up that sounds plausible and then I'll check later. One that worked when you were signing people up and one that worked when you were actually running payrolls. And it made, at the be very beginnings, it made sense. Different teams were working on these two things and they it wasn't until they'd grown big and complicated because the tax calculator, oh my goodness. If you want interesting domains, working on uh, payroll and benefits is actually super interesting because it's got so many corner cases. Um, we had two full-fledged tax calculators before we noticed that we really had two and that every time we changed one, we had to change the other, which is the definition of coupling. So uh, one of the senior engineers said, hey, this isn't right. A couple of senior people went off and merged the two calculators into, into one. Well, as soon as we had this this one tax calculator with a very simple interface, it was all primitives coming into it instead of being wired into Rails this and database that. We had one calculator, simple inputs, simple outputs. We said, oh, so, so, someone from marketing said, oh, I, I wish we, we could just have a tax calculator on our homepage. So now there is, because a programmer overheard this conversation, they said, oh, well, that's easy now. It would have been really hard before investing in the structure, but after investing in the structure, it's quite simple. So if you go to gusto.com slash, I don't remember what, you can say, what would my paycheck look like if I'm in Maryland and blah, 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 and you put in the all that stuff and out come the numbers. And those are exactly the same numbers that would occur were you to sign up for the service. So sometimes the structure itself creates ideas. Okay, so here we have this is this is development, and uh, it's uh, it's a this is a complicated system. There are a bunch of people involved. There are a bunch of uh, technologies involved, um, and it has all those. The development of a software system has all those features that we j just went through. As many 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 states. There's interconnections between stuff that nobody has a clue about. There's all kinds of variation. COVID hits and all of a sudden, all of your roadmaps, which aren't road, roadmap is a lousy metaphor anyway, should be like a compass directions. That would make more sense. We think we're going this direction. Well, COVID comes along and you're not going that direction anymore. All of a sudden you have to deal with the payroll protection program and off you go and everything has changed. So that's variation, happens all the time, people coming and going on and on and on and on. There's lots of variation. And uh, you're making, if you're working in large blocks of time, you're making irreversible decisions. And if you're making irreversible decisions, that whole structure of software development is going to be impossible to control. Um, e even if you break it down into smaller, reverse, more easily reversible decisions, you can't control it, but neither is it, is it completely out of your control. So that's where, this is where, uh, okay, so I'm about to get to reversibility. Here's the, here's the thing to note. If you have the behavior changes that you make to the system are irreversible. If, if, uh, if I change a line of code at Gusto uh, and we now submit the wrong reports to the IRS, you can't just say, ooh, ooh backsies. No, the, no, it had, if I change the behavior of the system, it has real irreversible consequences in the world. So I want to treat these decisions, irreversible decisions, very carefully. I want to vet them. I want to validate them. I want to be really, really cautious with them. But this is the point that like, had escaped me for so, so long. Structured decisions about the structure of the system are, ir are reversible. 
easily reversible. I extract out some helper method. And then somebody comes along and says, I don't like that. Like, okay, inline it, poof. It's as if I hadn't extracted that at all. When you get to larger scales, it can be hard, harder to reverse decisions. So for example, if I extract a service, don't get me started on microservices. All right, but uh, anyway, uh, extract a service, inlining that back in, it's going to be more work than that. There isn't, uh, in my IDE, there isn't an extract microservice, inline microservice, that doesn't exist just yet. I wouldn't put it past you guys to go and figure that one out. And I hope you do. But most decisions about structure are easily reversible. So we should treat behavioral decisions completely differently than we treat structural decisions. I have an experiment for you. Uh, <clears throat> if you wanted to try to apply this, uh, first, be very careful. I, I'm going to assume that you do uh, this uh, pull request, blocking asynchronous review stuff, which is, again, don't get me started. But assuming that you work in that style, each pull request contains either behavior changes or structure changes, but never both. That's the first one. Then the, the second part of this is you clearly label which of those you're operating under. And then pay attention to the results of review of structure changes and behavior changes. Oh, and uh, I would go so far as to say once you're, once you're comfortable with making this strong division between structure changes and behavior changes, the structure changes can be fast-tracked. As long as they pass all the tests uh, and uh, away it goes. You don't really need more review than that because if somebody doesn't like it, oh, that violates our layers, blah, blah, blah. Okay, go fix it or I'll go fix it. Either way is fine. So make this strong distinction between behavior, P, behavioral PRs and structural PRs and then see how you can apply uh, your review process differently depending on which of those you're dealing with. Now, sometimes you'll need to just go and you'll go and program and behavior changes and structure changes and everything is all blah, 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 munched together. Then if you're performing this experiment, you need to go back to, you take that big bunch of changes and you reverse engineer, you say, okay, well, I can make change this about the structure and this about the structure, and then I change that about the behavior, and then I change this about the ba 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 and away you go. And in the end, you'll have a sequence of really small diffs, each of which does uh prepares the either prepares for for changing the behavior or actually changes the behavior. So um one of my uh, most popular, my most widely viewed tweets, I guess. I don't know, popular. Seems like more of a value judgment. The, by measurement. Said, uh, uh, don't make hard changes. First, make the change easy. Warning, this may be hard. Then make the easy change. So this being Ruby Land. I'll uh, turn that into an almost pronounceable acronym. Mick at Met. Mick at Met. Make the change easy, then make the easy change. So this is a, this is a style of development, a, a, a choice for how you approach development that says, when I'm faced with a change that's going to be hard, rather than just, oh, I'm going to do this, what could you do that would make that change easier? How could you invest in the structure 
so that the change would actually be a you know once we blah 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 then this is a one liner okay sometimes what you want to do before you make that behavior change is which would be hard is to make it easy first so uh make it mac it says uh, rather than doing hard things, make the hard things easy. Something about this seems to grate on a certain class of programmers. Now, I grew up as a programmer. My dad was a programmer, grew up in Silicon Valley, the whole thing. So I'm, I've known programmers literally my whole life. And some of them seem to have a masochistic streak to them uh, a streak that says uh you know yeah i'm gonna go in and i'm gonna through the power of my magical brain i'm going to change 50 12 things and all at once and then the first time i run it it's all gonna run and whoa fantastic and and there seems to be a kind of a power rush that comes of making that kind of a magical huge change and a huge psychic payoff the one time in your career when it actually works. Maybe like every 10 years you get one of those that actually works. And there also seems to be some kind of psychic blinders about the many, 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 many times when you try that trick and it doesn't work and it's a gigantic mess and it turns out that it's 10 times harder than you thought it was or it would have been easier but because of the way you did it it turned out to be much much harder and it just doesn't phase this class of programmers and i, I don't understand that um now i think it helps that i was never a big complexity person I could never take a huge problem and put it all into my brain and, and fix it all. So from very early on in, in my programming career, I had to make things simpler, not out of some, I mean, it's just, it's just a, 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 a survival mechanism for me. I just couldn't make behavioral changes if I didn't make the structural changes first. This just wasn't an option for me. And, uh, uh, my good friend, Kevin Ryan, who's still out there programming and doing wonderful work on uh, on games, he was the exact opposite. He could just take enormous amounts of complexity, put it into his head, and somehow manage, the, manage that whole thing and get stuff that would work. So Incredible Machine is one of his, his uh, things. Anyway, he, he could do that. I couldn't do that. So I was forced into this tidy first. And then once, once you're in the world of making structural changes, refactoring comes as a very natural consequence because you don't want to break things and you want to work in small pieces and you want to be able to abandon structural changes halfway through if you learn something or priorities change without having lost all of the investment that you make. Um, now, this does presume... I was hoping I'd have a chance to talk about this. This is a little bit of a finger wag, so prepare yourselves. Um, this presumes that making a single change is quick and cheap. And another one of these wheels that's turned is when I started out in programming, you'd submit a deck of punch cards, and then hours or days later, you'd get a stack of green stripe paper that's the output of it. Many, many very smart, very wise people worked extremely hard so that you could just change something and see it. So this is the certainly the small talk ethos. It's been the Ruby ethos from very early. And we would always thumb our noses at the C++ people with their 48 hour builds like, ah, yeah, you guys, you, you know, if if a change takes 48 hours to validate, you have to make big changes. You have to make big changes. And we had gotten onto this new style of programming where we could just make change. I could make 10 changes in a minute and it's just fine. I could get feedback from each of those changes. Uh, Test-driven development 
took that substrate that you could make changes and get feedback quickly and and uh, amplified it by giving you better feedback on more of the system in, a, in those short periods of time. Somehow, we have lost the plot in software tools. I'm now seeing build times that take 10 minutes or an hour or multiple hours and no shorter path to any decent feedback than running the entire build. And it's, I, I don't understand it. It's like we're back to punched cards. And again, this is maybe a little masochism or a little gatekeeping, like, oh, if you're not smart enough to program like this, then you're not smart enough to program. And I think it's, I think it's uh, horrible. And I, the, the measure that I wished that we could adopt for our programming tools is latency instead of throughput. How quickly can I get feedback? And if somebody comes along and says, oh, a tool chain this and blah, 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 that, and here's this thing, and it only adds 12 minutes to the tool chain, which is always already an hour and a half long, well, who cares? No, I think that's not okay. I think that I would much rather have less feedback in a second so that my flow of thought wasn't interrupted and I could get back to work. So if you're working on software tools and every programmer should at least think about working on software tools because they affect you all the time, think about the latency of the feedback that's provided. So uh, end, of, end of finger wag, but yeah. So let's take this idea and crank it up to 11. I don't have very many tricks, you know, so let's crank this style of development up to 11 and, and see what happens. I, I, again, I'm short of time to tell you about all of this, but uh, I have another experiment for you, which is cheap and easy to do. Uh, and it's an alternative to test-driven development. Oh, I said I wasn't going to do polls, but I would love to do a poll and find out how many people use test-driven development on a daily basis. Uh, speaking to the meeting gods, if that happened, I would be happy. Thank you. So uh, TDD encourages you to work in small cycles, but could it be better? Uh, I was giving a code camp in uh, Norway at Iterate, and I told my the, the participants about this workflow that I had, where I would run my tests, and if they passed, I would make a little git commit. And that meant that any time I got into that state where you're like, it's broken and I didn't change anything, you always change something. That's the first rule. You always change something. How can I get back to a known good state? There was always a commit for that. And you could always go back to it. And uh, Admund Stroma, one of the, the participants said, well, by symmetry, which is another one of my tricks, and I didn't think of it this time, so I'm like a little bit miffed, but there you go. By symmetry, if you commit when the tests pass, shouldn't you revert when the tests fail? So here's how that works. You program, program, program. You say save. Automatically, the tests are run. If they fail, the last commit, which was the last time the tests all passed, per definition, just gets, gets pulled in. So I write 10 lines of code that I'm sure works, and I press save, and it poof, it just disappears. And uh, I'm like, oh, that can't be possible. I know that works. So I'm going to type it in again. So I type it in again. Poof, it disappears again. Goes straight to this revert. And now I'm thinking, oh, oh. 
So now I better think about what's actually going wrong. So is there a way for me to type two lines of code that will be consistent with the current tests? And then that'll make a commit. And then at least those two lines aren't going to get poofed on me. Okay, so and and that's the that's the magic moment when you think here's this single chunk of code that I can't make that's irreducibly smaller, and I make it even smaller than that. Um, as soon as I started using TCR, ah, uh, I would I'd gotten kind of bored with TDD. It's like I know the moves. Yes, you can apply it in different domains, but the workflow itself was like old hat. TCR lit me back up again. Like, oh, this is impossible. These five lines don't work, and it's impossible to figure out how to introduce them one at a time. Hmm, maybe not. And uh, so what TCR is, is an incentive system that incentivizes you to make changes smaller and smaller. And this is easy, easy to, um, to experiment with. Uh, I have a, a YouTube video of, of like an hour of me or an hour and a half of me doing TCR on a data structure, the rope data structure. And there's a video in there about setting up your system so that uh, v VS Code in particular, so that TCR happens to you automatically. This is another, this is one of these, this is a easily reversible. You can try this out. It won't ruin your life. It's not like, uh, I don't know, some uh, drug that you take that eliminates your ability to, to have joy. You try this out, doesn't work, poof, it's fine. But if it does work for you, the, the, there's, for me, part of the payoff of TDD is a reduction in anxiety. It's like, oh, does this work? Well, I just run the test. Sometimes I'll run the test three, four times before I feel relaxed enough to move forward. TCR is that squared because every single little change that you've made has been validated. And I have a blast with it. I uh, recommend that you try it. Um, and that's what I have prepared for you. I will be on Slack. Um, if you have questions about what we've talked about, what we, the Royal, we have talked about, if you have questions about, uh, what I've talked about or how to apply it or how does it come into Ruby, please let me know. I'd be glad to discuss it. And one more banjo tune. say this has been one of the most fun keynotes I've ever experienced in my life, mostly because it started and ended with a banjo. So, Ken, massive appreciation and thank you to you. Huge, huge uh, thanks. Like he said, head over to the Slack channel, follow up with him there if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, have a wonderful and fantastic dive into day three, everybody. Um, make sure to find your tribe and any of the Slack channels that speak and resonate to you. And of course, if you have any questions, we'll see you on Slack. Thank you again, Kent. Much appreciated, my friend. My pleasure. Okay.